good afternoon uh, or morning, depending on what time zone you're in. Uh, thank you for joining us for the, the first in a series of NCS4 online forums. Um, I'm Daniel Ward. I'm the Assistant Director of Curriculum here at NCS4. Um, as many of you know, in NCS4, uh, we're, we're well known for a wide range of uh, multidisciplinary training and professional development programs um, aimed at enhancing safety and security within communities, uh, specifically communities hosting sports and special events. Um, like many of you individually or organizationally, we've had to limit our face-to-face -face interaction. Um, however, through this webinar series, we're hoping that we can continue connecting practitioners with uh, information and most importantly, one another. Uh, before we kick things off, I wanted to let you know we've built in a break session for questions. Um, if you look to the right of your screen or just below if you're on a smartphone, you should see a questions feature. Uh, please feel free to pose questions at any point during the presentation. We've built in a break mid-presentation so that we can answer some of those questions. Um, and immediately following the presentation, we'll, we'll answer additional questions. Um, with that said, uh, we're starting the series off today with a presentation on virtual queuing from Drew Pittman. Um, Associate Athletics Director of Baylor University. Drew? Well, thank you, Daniel. Appreciate uh, you having me on today. I'm excited uh, to talk about uh, virtual queuing. Um, but first off, I just wanted to say uh, a big welcome uh, to Dr. Hall. We're excited uh, to have her um, as part of the center. She's been involved, uh, obviously, with the center for a really long time. But Dr. Hall, i um, excited to have you in a leadership position uh, now. Um, Let's talk about virtual queuing for a few minutes. Uh, once again, as, as Daniel said, good morning. Um, excited uh, to have everybody on um, wherever you are. Uh, hope everybody uh, is healthy and doing well. Um, but let's spend some time digging in on uh, virtual queuing. Um, so let's first kind of talk about why and what and, and how we would do this, but um, what is this and how does it affect uh, the spectator experience? So queuing concerns, um, really, we talk about the current space we're utilizing for queuing uh, right now. So in most instances, um, we've got, uh, you know, somewhere between four and nine square feet per person uh, to queue. This is kind of best case. Um, we've obviously seen lots of places uh, and a, a lot of bad queuing uh, pictures um, where there is less space um, and the crowd is really at a higher density. Um, so the uh, the green guide, the SGSA um, uh, version, uh, really calls these scenarios acceptable because of short duration. But obviously, we work in every instance to make these uh, uh, into that four to nine square foot. Um, really, when we talk about this and we talk about what we're experiencing right now um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we see a lot of moves towards physical distancing or social distancing. So how do we accommodate? Um, a physical distance queue. And when we talk about a physical distance queue, what exactly does that mean? So in most instances, if we look at that six feet or two meter um, space, we're talking about, you know, 36 square foot per person. So somewhere between, um, uh, you know, nine to four times as much space. So as you have a 5,000 square foot queue space, that could be uh, changing it to a 20,000 square foot queue space or a 45,000 square square foot queue space if we're thinking about utilizing the same number of patrons in queue and just making that space physically bigger. Now, I don't know about most of you, um, but I would imagine that if you're in these uh, tight stadium urban environments that a lot of us find ourselves in, um, you may not have the ability to expand your queues uh, to really meet that need of, of being able to queue all those folks. So we're trying to come up with a solution for that that is uh, a little bit more unique. So let's just look at that physically, though. Um, for a few more seconds. This is uh, just kind of a picture of a, a six foot distance uh, graphic to try to illustrate to folks what uh, social distancing or physically physical distancing means. So as you think about this, you think about that four square foot that you may have um, to queue. Maybe you're in a little bit better si situation. So you've got more like nine square feet to queue. Um, but once again, what we're looking for now in this six by six or two meter by two meter roughly queue space um, is 36 square feet. So you can imagine just as this multiplies time and time again, um, a lot of space needed to queue folks in this. And maybe you're thinking about graphics on the ground and different support elements, kind of bordered tape. Uh, I'm sure many of you have uh, experienced this in different uh, establishments that you may have had to visit a grocery store or uh, some sort of uh, hardware store, something like that, where they've got this marked on the ground. Uh, and you can imagine 
that may work in an application where you don't have as many um, people, but in a, a mass gathering type situation that we find ourselves in at our events, um, that's going to be difficult. So just as an example, um, this would normally in this amount of space um, be uh, enough area for about 972 people. Um, but right now in this in this social distance queue, um, we're only showing 108 people being able to fit in that same space, maintaining um, their social distancing. So as, as everyone may have experienced, and I, this is not um, uh, exclusive, there are some events that, that may not face this challenge, but ingress volume generally increases closer to event time, right? So here's an example um, from a football game we hosted last fall. Um, it was a uh, like a 305 or 310 kickoff. Um, so between uh, 2 and 2.30, we had about uh, a little bit over 5,000 patrons uh, enter the venue. That's, that's right at gate open time. So some people ready to get there, ready to get the best seat, um, just excited to see some sort of pregame activity. Um, between 2.30 and 3, a little more, uh, you know, 8,871 people entering the venue. Um, and then between um, 2.30 and 3 p.m., uh, you know, right then before kickoff, uh, 88, 18 entering the venue. So just a, a, a pretty steady um, set of people entering there. So after 3 p.m., so within, you know, five to 10 minutes of kickoff, 14,390 people are in the venue in that 30 minute window from three to 3.30. So obviously um, this, is, this is dramatic and it just increases that crowd density and then the wait time. So um, as you think about virtual queuing, you know, think about queuing, this is not a unique um, problem as it relates to how we experience these events, right? We, we have fans who are used to waiting in lines, but maybe they're seeking a better experience. So as you think about the use of virtual queuing, think about it both from a crowd distancing standpoint, from a physical distancing standpoint, but also think about it from an ability to uh, provide your fans um, maybe just a better experience as they arrive. Think about the other um, concerns you have about these queues. Maybe these queues are, uh, you know, a soft target at your venue. Maybe you're concerned about the potential of these folks uh, to be targeted for some sort of attack before they've reached that security screening point. So just think about the, the different opportunities this may bring you. Um, so virtual queue options, and this is one we'll spend just a, a few minutes talking about. Um, really, what is a virtual queue? What do we mean by virtual queue? So basically, the, the concept is, instead of bringing everyone to your venue and just having them wait in a line uh, to go through security screening, ticket validation, whatever it is that occurs um, when people reach your facility, what if they had the ability to get in that line virtually via a mobile device, via some set of set out parameters so that they knew when to come and actually get into that line when that line was shorter, less crowd density and less occurring there. So that's kind of virtual queuing just in a nutshell, but what are the ways and what are the solutions we can, should consider um, as we look to how do we make virtual queuing work? So how does that patron know, uh, hey, I've signed up or I've been assigned a time or a gate or, or both um, to come into the venue? So there's different, different solutions that we could look forward toward that. Um, and let me just first off say, um, this is not a um, well-used technology uh, in the sports and entertainment market right now. I can point to a few case studies, a few examples of folks that are using it, um, but this is a technology that's kind of found itself more at home at theme parks, uh, maybe at different places that may have uh, long queues, like uh, going to a driver's license office or uh, some situation like that. So if any of you have experienced this at a theme park, you may know what I'm talking about, but basically, um, some of the theme parks have apps now where you can go in, you can pick the attractions that you may be interested uh, in visiting, and you can go and, and pick a time when you'd like to go there. And then when you arrive at that time at that attraction, generally there's a short to no line, and you just walk in and, and get in line for that attraction or get directly onto that attraction. So similar thought uh, in the sports and entertainment market. What if you could sign up for a time and a location or be assigned a time and a location? Um, so that you could approach the venue, there'd be uh, a short to no line uh, to get in, and then it would alleviate some of those space considerations um, from the previous slides that we may be concerned about. So in an app or ticketing-based solution uh, used to meter this location and capacity, basically we don't want too many people approaching. We want to be able to maintain that 
um, physical or social distancing while allowing ourselves some other uh, success there and just uh, having fewer amount of people to be a soft target there at the entry of the venue too. Um, so as we look at an app solution, um, this may be a, a stadium app or a fan app that you may already have. Maybe you're able to push out a notification through that app um, prior to the event, the week before the event to say, hey, we're now accepting um, entries into the queue. Uh, what time would you like to come in? What are you interested in? Where do you want to come in and try to meet or how many people there? Um, a ticketing solution. Um, many of you have experienced this in the past. All our hard tickets um, used to have a, a gate entrance prescribed to them. Some of us still do that um, now where your ticket may say, hey, enter at the south entrance or enter at gate B. Um, so in addition to that, we'd be looking to um, put a time relative to that. So maybe that's something you could do um, with your ticketing. Um, the ticketing uh, solution, we like to look at that one a lot because it creates this all-in-one queue verification ticket validation opportunity, right? So as a patron comes up, um, they've been in this virtual queue, they've signed up um, through the app or, or through your ticketing system or you've assigned them a time. Um, once they get there, it's kind of a one-stop shop. You're scanning their ticket um, and that's verifying, hey, yes, it's time for you to be in the queue, um, but it's also validating that ticket for entry into the stadium. So when we look at, at virtual queuing, our ticketing type solutions are definitely um, one that we're really interested in. Um, so we're scheduling these arrivals based on demand and capacity, uh, what, what each gate is, is able to hold at that time. Um, you know, we have several gates um, around our football stadium. Um, some gates have more capacity for queuing. They have more line space. They may have more entry space. They may have more ticket scanning. They may have more security screening. Um, so we're scheduling based on these capacities um, at our gate. And then we're scheduling based on demand as well. So we may have the ability based on who wants to go where to, to kind of shift those things around. If this gate's really popular and it gets um, full based on people signing up for the virtual queue, um, then we're able to um, move people around to different gates with that virtual queuing. Um, so instead of walking up and seeing, you know, one really packed gate and then walking around the stadium, um, and seeing a gate that doesn't have as much um, utilization, we're able to kind of send people and message to people, hey, here's where you should go um, to be uh, in this and, and be in the shortest line. Um, it may also allow us the ability to um, create zones or segments within the venue. Sometimes we've done this in the past um, for um, different club or premium uh, opportunities. Um, but this may allow us to create these zones as well to have fewer people crossing over from a physical distancing standpoint. So, so lower the capacity or lower the, the, the utilization of different parts of the stadium and, and create more space there. Um, it may also let us support um, different services if a patron's able to self-select. So one of the ones I've heard a lot of questions about in the last couple of weeks um, is elevator usage. How many people can we put on an elevator? How many people can we fit on an elevator in, in a social distance? Um, type operation. So this may allow us to um, kind of pre-schedule those and understand, hey, if we've got a lot of people who have elevator utilization needs, um, let's stagger them out a little bit farther so that we can make sure that the elevator is available. So we can make sure we have proper time um, to clean and sanitize that elevator car um, when it's available. And then if there's any seating options or uh, maybe captioning options that people need, um, this is an area where they could self-select um, for those services. If they haven't done it, um, when they're buying their tickets. A lot of times when you're buying your tickets, you've self-selected for those services, but the elevator one uh, is one that we've just in the past really seen as a given, hey, I need to come in and get an, an elevator. Um, it also could give us the opportunity, if you have an entrance um, that has an elevator, you have another entrance that doesn't have an elevator to make sure you get that person in queue um, at the entrance that has the services um, that they need. Um, so let's just take a, a brief break there. That's a lot in uh, you know, a really short, uh, eight or ten minute block. Um, so if we have any questions um, there as it relates to uh, just that real brief intro to what's virtual queuing and then we'll go into a little more detail um, about what we may have. So any questions uh, there about virtual queuing so far? Absolutely. Uh, we have a, a few great questions. Uh, before we start answering them, uh, I did want to let everyone know that if we aren't able to get to your question today, certainly after the fact, we'll be able to reach out to you individually. Um, either us at NCS4 or Drew uh, will take the time to, to connect with you, um, especially if it's, if, it's, if it's a question outside of virtual queuing, we'll, we'll take that time after the fact. Um, so one of the first questions, Drew, we had 
is do you think gates op do you think gate opening time will be earlier to handle the social distancing? Uh, I think that's a great question. I think there's a lot of uh, different things that play into that. It really may depend on capacity, right? So we've seen a lot of models. Um, uh, you know, the state of Texas is starting uh, an opening process uh, tomorrow that uh, lets retail establishments open at 25% capacity. So obviously, if you're opening at a lower capacity, you may not need to increase um, gate opening time, um, but definitely you may need to have some extra time available. And we'll we'll talk a little bit about what that extra time may require uh, kind of in the uh, the second half of the presentation as well. Great, and we do see some people raising hands uh, within the webinar. If you could, um, as opposed to, to raising the hand, if you could pose the question in the questions feature, we'll certainly try our best to make sure we're answering those. Um, next question, uh, does the application account for the time travel to the venue? Um, so that's another one as well. So we're still in the kind of the development phases of these, and I'll talk in the second part about you know where the products are in the market right now as far as maturity. Um, but with the, the geo capabilities of your smartphone devices and other devices you may use for this virtual queuing, um, it's definitely possible. I, I think a lot of people have uh, used um, the mobile ticketing piece um, in this realm, in the sports and entertainment market, and maybe you've got that ticket popped up uh, on your phone and it, it knows to, to make itself visible when you're in the geographic vicinity um, of the venue. So there's definitely opportunities that you could put travel time in there as, as part of the of the circumstances. Great, and this one's a two-part question, Drew. Um, what is the plan for individuals who show up um, out of outside of their scheduled time? Um, and how would you handle fans who are upset about having to arrive at certain times? Yeah, so let me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk specifically about what happens when somebody misses their time or what happens when someone doesn't sign up for time in the second part of the presentation, so I'll get to that. Um, as far as, as what happens if somebody's upset about this, you know, this is um, a similar implementation as all of us have experienced with maybe clear bags or walk-through metal detectors. I think the communication uh, is key to this, right? We have uh, a fan base that this will be new to. This will be brand new. In fact, virtual queuing is brand new to all of us um, really in this industry. Um, so the communication piece on why we're doing this, how we're doing this, what's required to do this um, will really just be critical um, to get your fan base on board. Um, you know, a lot of different opportunities. Um, with different video messaging, social media messages, maybe you use your mascot um, to describe the virtual queuing process, or maybe you use a well-known fan or a, a well-known performer or athlete as, that's part of your event. Um, but I think there's a lot of really good opportunity for this to be a really positive thing for our, for our patrons, um, but that communication piece on this will be key. We've had several questions regarding uh, the, the PowerPoint presentation. We are going to make that available to you after the fact. Um, and again, if, if you have a question um, outside of virtual queuing, we'll make sure to get with you after uh, the, the presentation on an individual basis. Um, a couple questions that, that I also have here, uh, Drew. Um, how would you be prioritizing between app-based and ticketing-based solutions? Um, you know. I think there's a lot of great opportunities. It really depends on how you find your place uh, in the market and what maybe what you've already got available. If you have a really robust um, app-based system and a really robust development team or company that you're working with on that app, that might be the right solution for you. If that's a way that you are communicating with your fans um, regularly, maybe that's the place they're used to going for that information. Um, I think that's great. Um, the ticketing system, um, is is going to be probably a little bit more straightforward um, because the information about the patrons, about their seating, about where they're at, um, a lot of times their communication information is already in that system. Um, and as ticketing uh, keeps occurring closer and closer to a game, even up into you know an hour or immediately before the event, um, the ticketing system has that information in it, and it doesn't have to to flow out of that system. All that to say, there can definitely be um, kind of a, a, a joining of those two types of applications, and um, depending on how you're able to integrate, and we'll talk a little bit about this in the in the second half, um, you may be able to use um, some combination of those two to really make this the most robust um, platform as possible. Um, another question, uh, can you explain more about uh, zoning or the segmenting of venues you had previously mentioned? 
Sure. And, and we've looked at that a little bit uh, more recently, just as far as um, venue capacity. There may be places in your venue um, that are really popular. They may, they may draw lots of people in. Um, and maybe that's a, a specific concession stand or specific area within the venue. And we'll talk a little bit more about kind of virtual queuing for concessions in the second half as well. Um, but this may allow you to create bounds within the venue. And so to create those bounds and to make sure that people are in the right area to get to their seating, um, virtual queuing kind of allows you to assign that geographic location for people to enter um, to make sure they get to the right place within the venue. So any other questions, Daniel? Um, yeah, how will we know how many people um, to put in an area or into queues? Yeah, and so I'll talk a little bit about that in the second half as well, but um, really we'll look at the space available um, that you have for queuing. What kind of space do you have? So what's that square footage allocation? Um, and then the amount of time or the throughput you feel like you can get out of those spaces. And that'll be a little bit different for everyone, depending on the type of screening um, you're doing, depending on your um, ticketing um, that you're doing. Um, but we'll look at both of those as far as just the amount of space and then the throughput. And, um, put some math together to to work through those. And th there's still some questions here we're, we're going to try to get back to um, here shortly. I do know for the sake of time, uh, we'll continue the presentation here momentarily. But one last question, Drew. Um, we had someone, ha have we looked at embedded capabilities to monitor social distancing within the app using Bluetooth or some other smartphone, smart device capability? Yes, I'm sure a lot of you have seen um, the different technologies, uh, specifically Google and Facebook have um, put out some stuff uh, relative to uh, especially trace tracking um, when someone um, may have become infected um, with the virus and who's been around them and, and who's in there. So it's also possible you could use this from a social distancing standpoint, um, depending on how your apps develop. Um, a lot there um, from a privacy standpoint that you'd have to dig into uh, with your uh, with your counsel and with your uh, with your attorneys. Um, but there's definitely capability um, for all that, depending on how you've uh, worked through app development. And we we've right. certainly have questions regarding additional resources, information, guidelines that that um, participants might be able to take advantage of after the fact. We'll, we'll make sure to to work in some time to discuss um, things that you're familiar with that might help. Um, others out through. Yeah, absolutely. And let me just go ahead and tell you, I mean, this is uh, kind of how this presentation uh, came to fruition, but we really want to have a conversation about this. So I do really appreciate um, all the questions. As I said, this is not um, really a mature product um, in this industry right now. So we are definitely trying to um, come up with solutions um, for virtual queuing and for the, the queuing challenges we'll have and the guest uh, experiences challenges we'll have. So I really do welcome all your feedback. So even if you don't ask a question today, um, but you come up with something when you're thinking about this this afternoon or in the next few weeks, um, uh, Daniel will have my uh, contact information. Be happy for you to reach out to me and just share that with me because we're actively working on um, developing these technologies right now. So um, guest experience enhancements, um, really talking about the shorter um, wait environments and the kind of streamlined uh, ability to get into these queues. So as we've surveyed our fans in the past, obviously one of the things um, that they are always most concerned about is how long they're gonna have to wait in line. Um, what's that line gonna look like? It's hot outside, they may be waiting in an area that's uh, you know, in direct sunlight or something like that. So we're looking at this uh, enhancement as the avail availability to offer this streamlined or shorter wait uh, environment. If anybody's been a part of using this type of technology in a theme park, I'm sure you can um, kind of second that notion that it's, it's really exciting when you're hey, you're going to go ride this great ride and you walk up and you just walk into the line and maybe wait behind two or three other people and then you get you get straight on the line and straight on the ride and uh, it's uh, it's really just a, a, a much better experience. Um, so also as we talk about, you know, packaging or order, ordering availability for concessions on arrival, this may be an opportunity where now that the fan knows when they're arriving, uh, specifically entering the venue, um, there's an opportunity that you may be through your app-based solution be able to put a concessions option there to where they can have their concessions items ready at a at a grab and go or a, a pickup station um, where they can pick those up as soon as they enter. They know what gate they're coming in. Maybe you can tell them, hey, around this gate there's these concession stands, um, and they can order from those and have those concessions available. So just another enhancement. Um, this also lets us support some premium 
premium offerings to some supporters. So if you have different supporters that fall in different levels, you may be able to offer them kind of a VIP experience as it relates to when they get in, where they get in, um, and other things you may have available to them. And kind of in that same vein, it may allow you to forge these relationships and communication specific to these guest needs, right? So one of the things our, um, our, our development staff, for example, they like to greet some of our guests, obviously now in a, a more distanced, uh, socially distanced uh, way, um, but they may like to greet those guests when they arrive at the stadium. So a lot of times that is a development staff member kind of standing out there waiting, waiting for a phone call. Hey, we're about to get here, wanted to say hi. Um, well, now you may have the ability to know when those patrons are arriving at the stadium and really be able to be there to welcome them, to forge those relationships, to have specific communication um, to those guests and make it a little bit more personalized um, experience, especially for some of those premium supporters or donors um, that may be uh, a bigger part of your uh, program. So just different arrival options there and just special attention that you're able to pay. Um, as we look at these, there's also, um, you know, challenges relative to, uh, to virtual queuing. So, you know, one of the questions uh, someone asked, it's kind of the last line on this slide is, what if a patron misses their queue time or they don't sign up for a queue time um, to start off with? Um, I think that'll be especially uh, impactful if you may have visiting fans arriving at your venue and maybe you do virtual queuing, but at their home um, venue, they don't do virtual queuing, or maybe you are an enter entertainment type venue. And so you have a lot of different clientele that maybe don't come to your venue as often. Maybe they only come once or twice a year for certain types of acts or performers. Um, so those may be situations where it may be more advantageous for you to push out a queue notification to those folks of, hey, you haven't signed up for a virtual queue. Um, given the time available. So now we have just assigned you a virtual queue. So if that's a push notification through that app, if that's um, some sort of email or um, so, uh, text message type notification, um, that may help um, the situation as people not missing their queue times, but also people that don't sign up. Um, there's also the ability, depending on how you um, set this up and what bounds you put this in and, and how full you make your um, virtual queues um, to reassign someone uh, a space in a different time in a virtual queue, right? There's also the ability, depending on how you decide to structure it, to have a non-virtual queue lane. Um, so people get there and they may not have a time in the virtual queue or they may have missed their time. So there's another lane there. What I'll, what I'll encourage you there is the more people we get into the virtual queue and the more we encourage them to arrive um, within that timed window for the virtual queue, the more successful we'll be. Um, you know, the last thing you want to see is, you know, a great operating virtual queue and then you've got this one lane that's got a line um, a mile long because those are the people that have missed their time in the virtual queue. So once again, communication for that, um, really critical. But depending on how you structure things, there may be some ability to be dynamic about reassigning another virtual queue time um, for those folks. So let's talk about some of these other implementation hurdles that we may experience. Um, I'll be real honest, we're developing this right now. We have uh, been working on it um, for a few weeks now and had talked about it prior to this, but really went into heavy um, work with it in the last few weeks. Um, it's a tech heavy um, integration. Um, there are a lot of different systems that may have to come into play with this. So the ticketing system we've already talked about, if you have a third party app or you have an in-house app that you've developed, um, you may be working on multiple integration hurdles between those. Um, I'll tell you that there is uh, obviously generally a timed nature to, to making those challenges. We, we usually start trying to promote and push out um, updates well in advance, uh, especially to our app-based systems, but also to how we work with our ticketing systems well in advance of the season. So uh, I have a, a countdown clock on my desk over here. It tells me that there's 134 days um, and uh, a number of hours uh, until the first uh, home uh, football game this fall at Baylor. Um, so we're, we're obviously under the gun as far as the time is concerned, but I will tell you that there is a lot of availability and a lot of time right now for people to work on this type of system and, and work through these integration hurdles. We've reached out both to our app developer uh, and to our ticketing uh, partner uh, and have started working through that process with them. Um, and they seem to actually be excited about this as an initiative and, and really excited to work on it. Um, so timing is going to be critical. Just like we talked about people missing their queue, that time to have the right number of people in queue uh, and have the right uh, people in the right space uh, is going to be critical. So your availability or your ability, excuse me, to um, keep your throughput really consistent. So if you've allocated um, 
you know, eight, nine, 10 seconds per patron. And that includes the security screening, that includes the ticketing validation. Um, maybe that's been your past. You just need to look at that and see if you really think that's practical in this sense, especially if you're gonna require them to use multiple apps or different interfaces. Um, so the more we can keep that to a single interface for their ticketing and their virtual queuing, um, the more that'll allow us to do that. Um, we've kind of come up with a little formula uh, and I'm happy to share the spreadsheet with, with whoever wants it, but it allows you to kind of uh, modify that queue time back and forth, depend on how much uh, square footage you have um, for queue, gives you that um, 36 square foot per person um, allocation there in the social distance model and then let you kind of play with all those variables as, as far as how long you think you have. And that, you know, by modifying that throughput time, you're able to determine, um, you know, who, uh, how many people you're able to have in that queue and how fast you're able to, to move those people through there. Um, so I'll uh, share that work, working with my colleagues um, uh, with you if, if you're interested in looking at that and we can get that to you. Um, existing IT infrastructure. So, uh, in many instances, we've got, um, you know, newer stadiums, older stadiums, mid-age stadiums, and sometimes you've had uh, upgraded IT infrastructure to handle ticket scanning, maybe on the Wi-Fi side of things, maybe patron Wi-Fi to allow them to download that. Um, that can be important, uh, depending on how your, your queuing system works and how your ticketing system works. Um, if you don't have that upgraded IT infrastructure, you may need to really, uh, really communicate out to folks, hey, you're going to need to have this ticket on your phone um, prior to uh, arriving at the venue. Everybody's probably experienced this in the mobile ticketing or maybe uh, with an airline ticket getting on a, a boarding pass, getting onto an airliner. Uh, somebody's sitting there trying to, to find that ticket on their phone or trying to download it on there. So depending on if you have that infrastructure there, uh, it may uh, be challenging or it may uh, change the communication that you're able to put out to your fans of, hey, make sure you have this on your mobile device um, before you arrive. Uh, and then there's obviously a segment of the, of the population that still does not have maybe a smartphone or a device that's capable of this or a device that's capable with uh, interfacing with your ticketing system. So just uh, the different options you may have to make available uh, to those folks that are still using um, a hard ticket or maybe you've decided to go to a hard ticket um, with those arrival times printed on it um, just changes your needs as far as that IT infrastructure. Um, I'll be real honest, there are no mature products. Um, on the market right now for virtual queuing in the event market. There are several um, products that are used in other markets um, that are being um, adapted to work in the event market. Um, we've seen some virtual queuing uh, in the app-based space um, at some major events. I think they used it a little bit uh, at the NFL draft last year, um, and it's been used in a couple of others, but um, this is a new and emerging field, so there really aren't um, mature products that have had all the kinks worked out um, and are really smooth operating. Um, but that's kind of an exciting piece of getting to develop this and kind of getting to grow this and, and make this work um, how we need it to work. Um, you may have to provide additional uh, entertainment for these early arrivals. So uh, there was a question in the first uh, uh, segment about, you know, are we going to have to open gates early? Are we going to have to let people in early? I think in general, um, depending on the capacity, once again, you may have to plan extra time for earlier arrivals into your venue. And once those folks are in your venue, um, you probably need to provide different opportunities to keep them entertained while they wait for whatever the main act is. So maybe at a sporting event, um, that's a, a musical artist that plays um, before the event or some sort of pregame show or additions to an existing pregame show. Um, but just important to be able to uh, you know, plan for that and understand these folks are not going to want to sit in your stadium um, with no entertainment relative to that. Additionally, uh, uh, you know, depending on the weather conditions, you may have to have other um, accommodations for those folks. So if that's um, more hydration stations, different opportunities there, and we could talk uh, a lot about how hydration stations work, may work in the post-COVID world, um, but just different, you know, grab and go concessions options and stuff to really keep those fans satisfied. Um, as they spend time in here. And then we've talked about what happens um, if someone misses that time uh, in queue. Oh, so let's talk about just the physical space planning piece. And uh, once again, I kind of already referenced um, a document that a colleague of mine, um, Fred Gardy's put together as far as how many people fit in queue and how you can allocate that space. But once again, 
Um, things are going to continue to change and evolve in this market as we look through um, how this pandemic uh, influences and affects what, what occurs. Um, but I would encourage you, your space layouts need to be uh, configured for flexibility. So um, the age of making hard line guides um, at our venues, um, which most of us probably don't do anymore anyways, uh, is definitely over. So the ability to set up temporary lines, to set up different um, queue configurations, I think will be really critical. Um, we've talked about those graphic reminders already a little bit, the tape on the ground or different uh, graphics applied uh, to the ground at your venues uh, as queuing uh, reminders and to set expectations for soaps. But uh, as you look at those products, I would encourage you to talk to your, your signage vendors about, you know, is this product able to be applied more than once? What's it going to look up like when we peel this product up um, off the ground? Is it going to leave some sort of residue? Because from week to week and depending on crowd and depending upon the needs of the crowd and depending on what your local um, governing bodies may let you do as far as um, capacity, you may need to configure that crowd and configure that layout um, differently. Obviously, we're going to allow for more distance between queues, uh, between the patrons and queuing, but also think about um, the screeners and the ticket operations staff in there. Maybe this is a good time to look at um, ticket scanning pedestals or a different technology there. Um, saw a great presentation yesterday on screening, uh, and they referenced one of the technologies of a walkthrough um, scanner that may um, replace uh, a traditional metal detector that lets more people flow through in more lanes with less staff um, interaction. So just thinking about those different pieces of, of the queue piece, um, the virtual queue can't be successful without these physical queuing um, ramifications being met. Um, so important to think about these different pieces uh, of the puzzle. In addition, um, while we do need to promote that distancing between staff, we, we still do need to have staff available to guide patrons through this process. We may be able to augment that with different technologies such as uh, audio recordings, uh, signage, maybe you've got some video displays outside your venues that really demonstrate to folks how this process is going to work, um, but we just need to make sure that we're giving clear guidance to folks um, as they're moving through this queue process and how to make this the easiest. Once again, this is going to be new for us. This is going to be new for our fans. Um, so how we communicate this to them, both in advance, but also when they arrive um, at the venue to be able to make this a seamless process um, for them uh, should be really uh, a critical step in this process. So once again, just a really brief um, presentation on this virtual queuing and what, what we think may be in, in store for us. Um, with this as a uh, as a technology and as a platform available to you. Um, but once again, really excited to hear feedback from all of you on what you think may be successful and what you think um, we may need to, to take in the, into account as we look at virtual queuing. Um, but just wanted to open it up again to any questions um, that we may not have covered uh, in the first uh, question and answer session or things that we may uh, have uh, brought up during the second half of the presentation. Yeah, Drew, we had uh, several great questions. I'll, I'll start it off with, uh, can you talk through the, the revenue generation piece? And also, um, are you going to need more staff to be able to operate virtual queuing? Yeah, and so the revenue generation piece, you know, not something that I always cover um, from a safety and security end. Um, but, uh, you know, this technology, obviously, the integration with your ticket system, the development of the app uh, may cost money. Uh, you may need to make those those physical changes to your queue spaces. Maybe you've got to do these graphics. So how does this um, process or virtual queuing support uh, those changes and, and a part of the revenue piece of your puzzle? I know everybody's under um, different budget considerations right now um, with the cancellation of, of, of a number of events. Um, so we feel that virtual queuing is a space that could be a revenue generator for you. Um, either it could encourage people um, in a maybe a collegiate setting um, to renew their donor uh, level uh, at a higher level or at a at a similar level where they're at um, so that they can get to select Q uh, at an earlier time. We've looked at a model already here um, that maybe lets uh, folks at that higher donor level select earlier in the week about when they want to be in Q so they get that first and premier selection um, and lets people at a lower donor level select a little later in the week, single game ticket buyers after that. Maybe we've got students mixed in somewhere in there. Um, so we think there's a real revenue potential for this. In addition, um, you know, there's probably the ability for you to sell this as an add-on, um, even when people are purchasing single game tickets. So you could sell, hey, here's what a single game ticket costs, and you get to pick your queue time uh, on Friday night before the Saturday event. 
here's what a single game ticket costs. And for an additional um, fee of X, um, you're able to, to pick your queue time earlier. Um, so similar to how you've seen the airlines do different models as far as when you pick your seat or when your seat is assigned, um, there may be different opportunities um, with the revenue generation piece. Once again, um, that can I wouldn't let that be a driving factor um, to how you implement this. I think the technology uh, and the and the concept uh, is really great um, to promote just more safety and security at your uh, events. But uh, I do think there is some some benefit and some opportunities there on the revenue generation uh, piece. And then Daniel, what was the sorry? What was the second question? Uh, the second part of that question was, um, do you think there will be additional uh, staff required to manage this? Right. So I think depending on how we're, we're operating this, um, you may be able to use your ticket taking staff or your ticket scanning staff um, to really manage and operate these queues. Um, so I think it may um, uh, stoke some conversation as far as how you're operating or what the sequence is of your operation um, for um, for ticketing is right now. So you may do security screening and then you may do ticket scanning after that. Maybe you've got it the other way around. Maybe you do ticket scanning and then you may do security screening after that. So I think this is a conversation about how we're allocating staff and where we're, where we're allocating staff. Additionally, you may be able to operate this with fewer lines depending on how you stagger this. So if you're able to move people from a, a, a gate that's overutilized to a gate that's underutilized, you may be able to exchange staff between those areas. Uh, and really come out kind of at a net neutral as it relates to staffing. But that'll kind of depend on how you set this up and how you see this functioning um, at your venue. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of possibility there as it relates to staffing. Once again, we talked about the technology on the ticket ticketing piece. Maybe you're able to move to some pedestal ticket scanners. Um, so one person may be able to operate more than one pedestal at the same time. Just a lot of different options there. But staffing obviously is going to be a key consideration as we continue to think through this. Um, we had a couple questions uh, for NCS4 um, regarding the, the development of an app. Uh, we're, we're not developing an app. Uh, however, uh, like many of you with everything going on, we, we are trying to keep a pulse on um, how we're responding to the, the, the current threat climate, what we're doing. Um, we also had questions regarding uh, theme parks, what they're doing and best practices. Um, while I, I can't give you a clear cut answer now, we are we have been in communication with some of the, the major theme parks throughout the US. Um, and we do know that they do a great job with virtual queuing. If you've been to, to, to Disney World, you've gotten to experience the, the fast pass queuing. Um, what we're not sure is, is how they plan on addressing social distancing, uh, but we'll certainly circle back and, and we'll try to get some of that information for you. Um, Drew, another question for you. How, do, how are you handling uh, third party ticketing? Yeah, so I think most of us um, we're in a we're in a situation where our ticketing is done through a third party vendor. Um, I, in the collegiate world, you know, several several vendors out there, but that's who we're actually working with um, the most directly right now in developing this technology is with our third party ticketing vendor. Um, so I'd encourage you to reach out to them and work through them. A lot of you have contracts structured in different ways, um, but a lot of you have contracts that are structured where that third party vendor makes money when you sell this ticket. Um, so as you start to have those discussions with that third party vendor, what I would encourage you to, to you know, structure that, con, uh, that conversation around is, hey, so that we are able to sell more tickets, so that we are able to, to help you uh, ensure your revenue stream, can you help us develop this technology? Um, and that's the, um, that's the conversation we're having with them right now about how we develop this and, and how we work through that. Great. We had a question. Um... And I guess that extends to the tickets bought on the secondary market, such as person-to-person -person exchange of tickets. Yeah, and we do a heavy push um, to try to get those exchanges to happen through a um, an intermediary that's set up with the system. So obviously, we're a partner um, with one of the one of the big ticket exchange platforms. Um, and I think just for this, what we try to encourage from a communication standpoint with folks is use those platforms, um, be a part of that, because that allows you to most safely exchange tickets um, and make sure that your ticket is, is real and valid. Um, we've gone um, last year and then more extensively, we are going this year to the contactless ticket system. So that's actually an RF type um, exchange between your mobile device and, and the ticket scanner. So instead of physically scanning the barcode, you've got to make that that kind of RF handshake. Um, and that really lends itself to making sure that those tickets are being um, 
changed uh, over Valley. I know a lot of the different um, um, leagues and specifically some of the teams on the collegiate side have actually gone away from just this strict um, print at home type ticket because those are um, a little more easy to, to uh, work with in the fraudulent side of the market. Um, and so as we keep moving further down this dig digital ticketing um, experience, I think that'll, that'll kind of uh, sort itself out a little bit. Great. Now, and another question that's come up a couple times, some of our venues have, uh, they rely on mass transit to get guests or fans to their venues. Um, so has, has there been any thought on integrating with mass transit? Yeah, absolutely. So we see this as a technology that, uh, you know, I've talked about the um, guest entry uh, into the venue, um, but similarly queuing for mass transit. If you may have people that are queuing on a specific shuttle route or something like that. I know a lot of your mass transit systems, our, our bus system uh, here in Waco uh, has an app that shows wait times and, and stuff like that. So uh, a lot of great um, development can be done in that area as well, just to making sure that the lines and the, and the queues for those um, vehicles don't get too long and then the capacity on those vehicles uh, existed. So I'd, I'd work with your mass transit folks to just talk about, hey, are we gonna have to increase capacity um, to allow for people to ride mass transit in a socially uh, distanced environment? Um, and could we do some sort of virtual queuing so people understand, uh, even if it's not holding a space in line, which it may be, but just a wait indicator so people know hey if i if i get on at this time of day this is what it's going to look like and this is how long i'm gonna have to wait but once again i think virtual queuing for that space um, is really significant we've looked at it a little bit with our um, traffic and transportation piece just for folks that drive private vehicles to the venue um, so this may be a way especially uh, in times when road construction is going on or something like that that you may be able to alleviate some of that um, road traffic around the venue by specifically assigning different people different times to arrive at the venue. Um, that one's a little harder to enforce because of where people are on the road and stuff. And maybe you can say, hey, we're not going to let you into the parking lot um, till this specific time. Um, but a lot going on there uh, in that market. Uh, additionally, I didn't really talk about this, but we're trying to pair this a lot with uh, mobile ordering on the concession side to kind of cut down on those concessions queues as well and just kind of have. Uh, order pickup locations where you you've ordered it okay you've just made your order here's what time your order is going to be available so there's less people in queue and to try to cut down on concourse uh, considerations and and uh, congestion there and um, that that you actually answered one part of the next question I had which was concessions and and integrating virtual queuing into concessions but um, the other part was was restrooms what types uh, what type of thought have we put into to restrooms and the long wait times and lines and and um, obviously social distancing being a, a big concern there yeah so we we've thought about that um, pretty significantly um, in the last couple of weeks um, really thought a lot around that as providing people wait times at those restrooms to try to better utilize things so this may not be um hey the restroom that's immediately adjacent to your section um that you are always used to going to um is really busy and has a wait line but there's one around the corner that that no one ever goes to so can we provide um uh you know opportunities there um for people to see hey this is an area where i can go that's that's not uh, as congested and and has better uh better social distancing and at this point, I'd like to also mention, we've had several questions pop up regarding um, the, anything from mass temperature monitoring to medical and public health screening to disinfecting and sanitizing. Um, several of these topics we'll be covering in the coming weeks. Uh, so each week we'll, we'll have a, a new series or a new uh, webinar as part of this forum. So please stay tuned. Uh, we'll be announcing those uh, through our platforms and, and uh, we hope to, to see you at those as well. Um, another question, Drew, is, um, again, resources. A lot of people have asked questions about what resources are available. Obviously, we're gonna we're gonna make this uh, presentation shareable. We've had questions or people interested in the spreadsheet you had mentioned. We'll try to get that um, uploaded and available to attendees. Uh, but but what other resources and guidelines have you seen out there that can that can help them along the way? Yeah, so there's a couple uh, of different vendors um, that are already doing um, virtual queuing. Uh, this is a technology that's kind of found itself at home in a lot of different markets. Uh, we've talked about the theme park market. Um, it's also found itself uh, very at home in kind of the registration market at different conferences and types of events where 
Um, you know, maybe everybody shows up to register at the same time, but there's an open trade show floor or something where people can mill around so that they're able to do this. Um, so we can point you in, in the direction uh, of some of that as well. Um, but I will, I will be really honest with you. And one of the reasons, you know, I volunteered to, to, to help with this webinar today is this is a very emerging technology. So we're going to kind of have to all work through this um, a little bit together just to be able to, uh, you know, help our ticketing vendors, help our different app vendors um, build a, a more mature product that we think will work in the sports and entertainment market. Um, but we can definitely get you some of those resources. Um, the entertainment, the, the theme park, uh, I think a lot of you have experienced that. Um, and, and they do a really good job. And so there's a, there's a lot there, but I would just encourage you, talk to your ticketing vendor. Um, if, you, if you're working with a third party ticketing vendor, especially talk to your um, app developers, uh, if you're working with that and just kind of walk through this idea with them of what you're trying to do and what you'd like to do. Um, I'd, I'd like to say the good thing is we, we use, I think what is the largest collegiate ticketing vendor out there and we're working through that process with them. So hopefully, um, the benefit of what we're working through with them um, will be of, of benefit to all of you um, that are using that ticketing vendor at least. But, um, you know, work through those processes with those uh, with those representatives you have. And um, I think there's a lot of promise in what we can do here. And we, we've had several questions regarding um, who, who's deciding on the, the space planning and stadiums, um, if, if we're waiting on, on government. And, or clubs to decide individually. I, I would say from our end, one of the things that we, we've seen is that um, obviously things are extremely fluid, both from a legal standpoint and guidelines. Um, so we've seen several changes over the past several weeks um, and we're continuing to monitor that. And we certainly wanna get that out to everyone um, as soon as it is made available. Uh, we know that there's uh, NFPA standards and guidelines, club guidelines, federal guidelines, uh, but right now, we're seeing a, a very fluid environment as it relates to the in integration of social distancing um, and certainly public health uh, screening, et cetera. Uh, anything you'd like to add to that, Drew? Well, the, the, I'll tell you the one thing we've taken um, from just how dynamic the situation um, has been is that we can't really wait to figure out what those guidelines are that we're gonna have to meet, but that we've got to start working towards a, a lot of different options as it relates to the guidelines. Um, so obviously we've got a lot of staff working at home right now and we've put them on a lot of different projects of, hey, what would it look like if we only had 20% uh, capacity at our venue? What if we only had 30% or 50% um, capacity at our venue? What would it look like if we had to queue in the social distanced uh, model? So I would encourage you work through those, work through those with your, with your your partner agencies um, from public safety and public health um, world, but also work through those with other venues that you may know or be aware of. We're doing a, a weekly call in our conference with event managers uh, and facility managers. So I'd encourage you to start having those calls. We have, uh, we've been doing that one for about uh, three weeks now, I think, and just invaluable, just incredible amount uh, of information that has been shared um, on those calls with different ideas that people have. So. Really, I think for us to be successful, for all of us to be successful um, in this uh, post-COVID-19 world, um, we're going to have to work together and we're going to have to share and we're going to have to come up with new ideas and new best practices um, really right now while, while things are still emerging, but as we continue uh, to do that. So I'd encourage you to you know, get a group together, have a discussion, um, make it a regular um, part of your, of your week, schedule a, a, a Zoom call or a, a FaceTime call or whatever it needs to be um, so that you can really communicate and, and try to help us develop all those best practices. So Drew, uh, on that, you, you'd mentioned you've looked at different capacities, 20%, 40%, et cetera. I mean, I know this is a little outside of virtual queuing, but since social distancing has been an underlying theme to the discussion here, uh, we have the question about what, what have you been looking at as it relates to, to physical distancing within seating and certainly within egress to your stadium? Yeah, well, let me uh, let me start with uh, the painting. The best picture is that we hope um, that when we go to play football on September 12th, um, that there has been uh, massive progress in this, and we're at 100% um, capacity at our at our venue. That is that is our underlying goal with getting back to business uh, in the event world. Understanding um, from what I said earlier that we're trying to work uh, through options to everything. Um, we've looked at a lot of different options, everything from um, you know, spaced seating, um, skipping rows um, in, in different parts of the seating sections, 
um, how we utilize elevators to bring patrons uh, to suite, um, you know, what, what the capacities look like there. Obviously, um, smaller groups of people, twos, threes, fours, um, lend themselves to less density um, in the seating areas. Um, so there's some advantages there. At the same time, they let you, uh, they will not let you utilize as much of your seating capacity. Um, so there are a lot of different things going on in that market. Um, I think in a, in a social distance capacity, depending on what you do and the different models um, that we've seen um, from some really great folks that have put them together, um, you're looking at it being able to utilize, you know, probably somewhere between 20 and 30, maybe up to 35 percent uh, of the capacity at your venue. Obviously, that's a scary uh, thing that I just said. So uh, don't let me, um, you know, be all doom and gloom here. Um, I think there's more options and more opportunities as we continue to move through this um, for those capacities uh, to go up. But definitely, I would start working through that um, and having conversations um, with uh, with your folks and just deciding financially, hey, what makes sense? What could we do? What can we not do? You know, how do we um, how do we get back and get our events going again? Uh, now, but before I close out, Drew, any any last uh, comments or, or advice from you? No, I just wanted to I tell everybody how much I appreciate you being part of this. Once again, um, I really want this to be an interactive um, project and discussion. So if you've got any feedback um on on the virtual queuing piece but all this um feel free to you know send that to me um we've got the ncs4 connect um uh, message board i think that you could get on and post and i'll try to put some stuff up there as well just to encourage people to have a conversation there um but i just wanted to encourage you to to get with those at venues that are similar to you that may be geographically in the same area or may just be people that you know um, across the country and continue having these conversations, continue kind of fleshing out these ideas um, and figuring out how to make us the most successful. I, I think we all know that we're all tied together and, and intertwined here. Um, and so it's in all of our best interest um, for us to all be successful um, through this process of, uh, of getting back to business. So thanks again for everybody. And uh, Daniel, thanks for uh, NCS4 and everybody's time here today. Absolutely, Drew, thank you so much. Um, and before we before we close down here, I just wanted to to wrap up by again mentioning that we do have several uh, webinar forums coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, we're targeting Thursdays at the same time. Um, I know we'll be covering anything from public health screening, what we're doing procedurally, what types of technologies are available, uh, the capabilities and limitations of those technologies. We'll be speaking about venues and how we're working within communities and and the additional uses that we've seen with our facilities and how we're preparing ourselves for that. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, employee retention during this time, how we're engaging our employees and, and how we're maintaining a workforce to ensure that when it comes time to get back to work, we're prepared to do so. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, disinfecting, sanitizing um, our venues, what we need to be doing between events. Um, we'll, we'll have a great team to discuss that. So we're looking forward to, to sharing and communicating with all of you on this. Uh, we are a resource to you, so please feel free to reach out to us at any point. Um, as I had mentioned, we're going to take the time to, to look at these questions and make sure that if we weren't able to distress, discuss your question within the webinar, we'll try to follow up uh, with you as, as soon as we can. Um, again, thank you all for joining us today. We hope to see you uh, in the coming weeks. All right.